she's just like, oh, it's just muscle strain, muscle strain. I play basketball most of my life. I know what a muscle strain feels like, and this is not it. In 2013, I decided to go ahead and get birth control that was implanted into my arm. At the time, I didn't think anything of it, but there were a lot of complications, and seven months later, I ended up taking out that implant. The problem was that I also found this lump in my stomach, so I called my OBGYN and I made an appointment. They decided to give me an ultrasound. I got the ultrasound results back, and when I went in, I found out that I had four large fibroids, one being as large as 5.8 centimeters. I asked them what I should do, and they just told me, we'll monitor them and wait. And at a certain point, I looked pregnant. In 2017, I was 26 years old, and I started having these symptoms. I was getting cramps, like if you're on your menstrual cycle, but I wasn't having a period. And this went on for about a month and a half. I went to a doctor and I'm like, I'm concerned something's wrong. And they're just like, oh, you're just probably pregnant. We're gonna take another pregnancy test. And I was like, I've taken about three pregnancy tests already. And also, we're gonna test you for STDs. Okay, I get the results later that, of course, everything's negative, right? And I'm just telling everyone that I'm so upset, no one is listening to me. The last three weeks of my pregnancy, I had high blood pressure. I was told that I might have to go into labor early if high blood pressure continued. I went to my 39 week appointment and my blood pressure was high. I was met with my midwife's partner who was on call that day. I asked if I had to be induced. She said that if I chose not to be induced, I would have to sign paperwork saying that I refused treatment. I decided that I would be induced. My wife was not able to come with me at first and I was very afraid. Luckily, we weren't separated for long and she was able to come to the room with me once I got settled. I was rushed to an urgent care by a coworker because the pain was just excruciating. So I went in and I said, I have this pain and I'm crying and I can usually take a decent amount of pain, but I'm crying. She's just like, oh, it's just muscle strain, muscle strain. I play basketball most of my life. I know what a muscle strain feels like and this is not it. And during this time, I was getting bruises on my body very often. Every day was a new bruise. So I show her and I said, I'm getting these like red rashes on me and then this bruise. And she's like, oh, that's nothing. That has nothing to do with this. Those were the exact words. That has nothing to do with this. And at this point, I'm livid because you don't care about me. The first step of the induction was to give me a medication that I had to take that would help me dilate. Early the next morning, my doula arrived and helped me work through my contractions with the strategies we had been practicing. The midwife came into the room early that morning. One of the first things she said to me after I told her that I was contracting was, well, of course you're contracting and of course you're in pain because you're having a natural birth. You said you wanted to have a natural birth and natural births hurt. In that moment, I felt some type of way because I felt that she had this negative tone and I wasn't quite sure what it was about. So I just let it be and continue to work through my contractions. So when the doctors told me about my diagnosis for fibroids, they said that they would monitor them yearly 
And every year I had to remind my doctors that it was time to get an ultrasound and check the measurements of the fibroids. And I asked them again, hey, is this affecting my fertility? Is this affecting my health? Oh no, you're fine. Do you have an irregular period? No. Do you have any pain? No. I wake up one morning and I realize there's more than one large lump on my stomach. There's two now. And they checked my stomach again. Wow, they're really large. That seemed to be a continuous statement that every doctor that I went to see would say. On the fifth year, I went to a different doctor. And that doctor decided to give me a pamphlet. He never did a single exam. He never touched my abdomen. He never did a pap. He told me to come back to him after having a couple miscarriages. Having the doctor tell me to come back to him after a couple of miscarriages was the most embarrassing thing I would ever experienced. I didn't tell too many people about that, but I, I understood at that moment that my fertility, my pregnancies, that my, my life wasn't as important as others around me. I just felt like a burden every time I walked into a doctor's office. I was given the epidural and I told the midwife that I was working with that I was hurting. The midwife told me I was not hurting. It's not pain, it's pressure. She told me, you just want this to be easy. I know that it feels unbearable and I asked to get another epidural. I am not given another epidural. So I got set up with the new doctor, and this was my fifth doctor, but she was just my primary. I asked her, will you refer me to a surgeon? And she did. I was having pain in my head that was just, oh my gosh, it was so painful. There were knots in my head. I had my mom feel it, and I'm like, do you feel this? And they're like, yeah. I tell that same doctor, I'm like, I have these knots, and I can't turn my head to the side. Like, it's that painful. And she's like, Oh, those are just stress knots. I asked my midwife to explain to me all of my options. I wanted to know how much longer we would be going through the current process and what future interventions would look like. Ultimately, because my heart rate was healthy, because the baby's heart rate was doing fine, my midwife told me that we would continue the way that we had been going until I delivered and I didn't feel that I could do it for another day. I couldn't do it for another six hours or eight hours or 24 or 48 hours. And so I made the choice to have a cesarean section. A black nurse and a black anesthesiologist pulled me to the side and asked me if I was sure if I wanted to have a cesarean. I felt it was the best thing that I could do for myself in that moment to ensure that I had a healthy baby and that my baby wasn't put at risk because I wasn't getting proper care. I called a hospital and they said, come in to our walk-in clinic. We have really good doctors here on the weekend. So I show him all these bruises on my leg and he stopped and he's like, this is more than I can do here. He handed me a sheet of paper and said, here's information for an oncologist, I made you an appointment. So I look over and his screen is flashing red. So it showed that my white blood cells were really high, my red blood cells were really low, and my platelets were really low. And at the time I'm like, what does all this even mean? I remember my mom flying in, we're thinking we're gonna have this great weekend, she's gonna spend a weekend with me. And we go to the appointment, we're sitting in the room, and they take all this blood, and then the doctor comes in, and he rolls his chair over, and I remember he said, I'm sorry, but you have cancer. I think I was in such shock that I couldn't cry, I was just like stuck. And then he went on to tell me that I had ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, to the bone marrow, and that I had between 90 and 95% cancerous cells in my body. And the doctor said, we need you to go to the hospital right across the street. I need you to go immediately. We need you over there ASAP. When we went for our appointment, she spent 
five minutes with me and whisked me out of the room onto our next patient. On that second visit, my pre-op visit, the doctor didn't want to come to the office and called me on speakerphone. She had the worst attitude when I told her that I wasn't going to be doing the surgery unless she came to the appointment. She finally shows up two hours after our pre-scheduled appointment with an attitude and when she walks in the room, she asks me how my babies were doing. She was absolutely referring to my fibroids. I decided to call my insurance and tell them that she could not touch me and that surgery was only two days away. She was a young black doctor that I just felt, I felt like finally I would be understood and that was super important to me. After my baby was born, we discovered she had jaundice. She wasn't able to stay in the room with us. That hurt me a lot. I was very adamant that I wanted to breastfeed my baby. So I asked how much milk she needed. I was told that I can pump and give her milk. When I was told that the doctors wanted to supplement with formula, I told them, no, not yet. Let me try to feed the baby myself first. Doctors supplemented with formula without getting my permission. I walked into the hospital on Thursday. On Sunday, the cancer was moving so fast that I didn't walk out. I had a wheelchair. Finally, when everything settled a little bit, nothing really settled, but when I got the chance to think, I was so upset. It's hurtful that they don't believe you. The cancer that I had moved so fast. If I didn't find the one guy who finally listened to me to think where I would have been today is hurtful. And it's painful still to talk about. I missed out on catching my leukemia early. In June of 2017, I received a bone marrow transplant from a wonderful man that lives in Germany. Now I have a new blood type. That's pretty cool. I was O positive, now I'm A positive. There were some struggles after the transplant, but I am happy to say that now here in 2020, I'm doing really well. In remission, feeling great. Before I left the hospital, I was told that I needed to communicate if I got a fever or had excessive headache because it could be a sign of an infection. When I was in recovery, I started to have headaches, fever, sweats. I reached out to my midwife and was told to take a COVID test. I took a COVID test and was told that I needed to quarantine myself away from my family until I got my results. For two days, I stayed in the house away from my wife and baby and was not able to see or touch them. My fever continued to rise. My headache continued. I was feeling a lot of stomach pain and I ultimately decided to go to the emergency room. It was discovered that I had a postpartum cesarean infection. So I was super excited to finally find the surgeon that I wanted. And when I walked in her office, she said, hi, what can I help you with today? I told her, you know, I would love to get my fibroids removed. And she said, you know, I see they're large. I have to do a vertical incision. Normally the doctors do horizontal incisions, but my fibroids, just the four themselves were too large at that point. It was so freeing to finally have a doctor who didn't look at me like a statistic. I am a human. I had the resident that was with her come in and tell me, you know, hey, I expect to lose two to three pounds. They're not that big. And I said, okay. And I woke up and she removed 33 fibroids. I actually lost over 15 pounds of tumor. And that scar is six inches going up my abdomen at the top of my belly button. Now I have to have C-sections if I wanna have kids. Any other doctor before the surgeon that removed them, I felt would have just honestly taken my entire uterus out. And she made me a promise that she would do the best she could. And so I'm grateful.
Ultimately, I had a very traumatic experience. My wife was not treated with respect. She was often ignored and not talked to. She was called my sister. She was called my husband. I live in a world as a black queer woman raised in the South. As a mother, I feel that I have been judged and mistreated because of my skin, because of my sexuality. I feel like in the medical community, they tend to just rush to the last result with black women. And so hysterectomies just are so common. And I feel like we have the right to have children too. So don't feel bad for wanting to have a doctor who looks like you, who's had the same experiences. If I hadn't gone to a doctor who understood me, they would have taken my fertility and that was my biggest fear. My birth story included lots of microaggressions. Racism isn't always blatant. I'm doing all that I can to use my voice to speak up against the discrimination. Make sure you advocate for yourself all the time, you know, and take care of your bodies and take care of yourself. I really think that's important.